Hi. So he didn't mention it, but I used to work on the compiler a lot. Um, not anymore. So here I am to talk about my thing that isn't the compiler, uh, which is sort of, you know, really vaguely related to Scala. Frankly, nobody would invite me to talk at these Scala things if I weren't coasting on um, the past. And the, fortunately, the invitations are trickling away. So, but in the meantime, I'll abuse them to talk about things that have little to do with Scala, except in terms of you could use Scala on top of them, like this one. Virtual file systems. So you all saw the advertisement, I guess. That's why you're here. I, I don't even know if what I'm talking about is actually what's in there. Probably not. It's, but this is better. So you know, go with this. Um, yeah, I, I keep giving talks about this. And I guess I think they're, they're too unfocused because the idea is like so good and so big, there's too much I want to hit. So I decided with this one to go really narrow and just talk about typed files, which is this kind of nonsensical seeming notion, which is actually awesome. So here we go, typed files. Just think that, wow, typed files. What does that mean? So we live with file systems right now that are effectively typed file systems with one type. I mean, they're like dynamic languages. They're unityped. Every file is the same. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. What's in it? Well, you might have some hints. You might have a file extension. You might have uh, you know, the, a resource fork. You might just have a convention. Uh, it's, you, know, you might look at the first few bytes and see a bomb or XML thingy, whatever. But all these things, none of these things actually enforce anything about the file. They're all like heuristics you apply to try to figure out what's in there, and then you hope. And then if it's really important, you actually have to inspect every byte and make sure. And then as soon as there's one more write to that file, your entire inspection goes out the window. And once again, it's anything. Who knows? This is a crazy way to live. Crazy way to live. There's no reason to do it. We don't have to do it. Um, so let me define some things. Data is just bytes that we don't know anything about. A value is bytes that have a type. So it's data we do know something about, something that we know to be true. Uh, it has some form, it has some meaning, whatever. It's something other than raw bytes. And a type, which can be defined a bunch of different ways and is, but for our purposes, a type is a set of possible values for a blob of data. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean we can enumerate them, it just means that we can recognize it. So really at its, at its most simple and least elaborated, a byte, a, a type is a membership function. Does this pile of, of bytes actually meet some test that's important to me to say that it's a thingy, yes or no. And as long as I can ask that and get a consistent answer, then I have a type. Importantly, a, a type specifies all the possible values, not the, like just most, and we'll check at runtime and see if anything else snuck in there. Um, the notion that there is such a thing as a dynamic type is to me like very wrong-headed. They're using the wrong nomenclature. Types are static properties. They're not things you check later. It's not an, an you know, this is not an inspection, let's just make sure th sort of thing. It's a, it's a thing that's true, it's a formalism. Um, it's, you, it, you either know or you don't. These are very Boolean notions. So, yeah, and if, you have to, if you have to check, it's not a type. All right, so how might we define types? And I'm not really talking about typed files here yet, but of course, since you know where we're headed, you can sort of look at some of these things in that way, because that is where we're headed. So the, like, the very minimal form is, as already mentioned, just a predicate. Uh, something we can ask, an oracle, as it were, not the, you know, not the lawsuit-happy kind, <laughs> um, <laughs> but the kind that answers questions. So, and uh, so that's the minimal version. But we need, for efficiency and, and sanity, we need something much better than that. Um, we need, well, we'd like to be able to produce values of that type. That's much more useful than just being able to recognize values of that type. And that's normally the way we do it. We have what we call constructors. And constructors usually work on other types. Um, and then there's some mechanism by which you can unroll things all the way down to something primitive, where we have types like int or whatever, where you're just going to take some 32 bits and interpret it to have some meaning that it's a you know, assigned integer between int min value and int max value, whatever. 
point is you're just going to, at some point, you're going to just ascribe meaning to some bits. And then every other sort of thing is the composition of some previously ascribed meanings for some bits. But we're missing like a huge piece of the puzzle when we do things this way. Because what's really important in almost everything is not how to build things from scratch, but how to change them. Um, everything about programming is the incremental change of systems. Especially the bigger they get, the more important it is. And we throw away really important information when we don't think in terms of change. We say like, well, I have an A, and then later I have a B. But that's not enough information. We want to know when we have an A, if whether the thing we're trying to do to an A to get a B is itself acceptable. And that's not something that we can necessarily know by looking at A and B individually. So there's two things going on here. There's not just the virtual files. There's change orientation is sort of the unifying notion of like all the good ideas that I have that I can't do in Scala or anywhere else for that matter. So change T is undefined there and it's going to be undefined everywhere. But um, for some future talk, it's some type specific notion of how it is that it can be changed. Notice that it actually depends on the value so you can constrain the set of possible changes based on the value. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. Uh, like, so true, anybody who has spent any amount of time in this business has had to go back and rewrite something simple because they wasted half their life trying to push some complex thing into working. No comments from me, 3,500 commits into Scala C. Um, so, uh, the, like nothing, nothing uh, makes makes me warmer on the inside than the notion of a simple thing that works continuing to work. Um, and what's really at the heart of this, though, is is change. The re the reason you can say a thing like that is that it matters how you get somewhere, right? There's a huge difference between a system that is just dropped on you as is, and somebody says, "Now make it do this." and one with a very clean series of changes to a very simple beginning that got where it is. I mean, a huge difference. These are night and day, and yet we act like they're the same, and like it only matters you know, what sort of changes we're going to make to it. But its whole identity is actually wrapped up in how it got here. So we have these constructor-oriented languages pretty much universally. But we could limit construction to really simple things and then make you change things to get where you want to go. And by controlling change, instead of trying to control construction, we can enforce more interesting things than we can enforce in values alone. I hope my next slide is what I, oh yeah, it is, okay. So there was my little first example there. Uh, I have a couple of tuples, three o'clock exactly 75 miles per hour, three o'clock and one second, zero miles per hour. Now, either of these is fine in isolation. There's no way to look at one of those and say that's an unacceptable state. However, the change from the first to the second is highly unacceptable. That's what it looks like when you crash into a wall at 75 miles per hour. Um, this is a material difference, right? I mean, like it should be obvious here. But this kind of example is everywhere if you think about it. Um, and it's not just about the things you can rule out. It's the errors that become extremely obvious. Uh, when you see things in terms of what change just took place, rather than two distinct things, is this okay, is this okay? We can't look at them individually. We have to look at what we're doing. So we constrain, instead of the set of possible values, the set of possible derivations. In other words, the set of possible histories of a particular value. So if we want to say with a straight face that we have typed files, then there's no sort of like retrofit we can do where we're like, yeah, man, it's really, it's typed. And if you can change it in such a way that it stops having whatever invariant we associate with a type, then it's not a typed file. It has to be always that. Like we, we don't let our programming languages say like, it's a string probably unless somebody did this or that. I mean, it's a string. It has to be. It always is. Same with a file, and we can do this. This is what part of what, a small part, but a really important fundamental infrastructure sort of oriented part of my idea. And here's how we do it. 
Before we can do that, though, we need an intermediate step, and that is to have immutable files, which sounds kind of nuts, except that we use immutable files all day long. Probably everybody here uses the same system for immutable files. What's that? Yeah, and Git in particular, right. Version control in general and Git in particular, which is impossible to avoid even if you don't like it. Um, <laughs> But, but Git is really just a, a nothing more than an immutable file system, something that is just a very straightforward, here's a hash, here's some data, and now if you want to change it, I'll give you a different hash. And I'll keep track of that and the change, and I'll just have a bunch of changes all lined up. Well, great, that's just what we need for what I'm describing. So that's just the kind of thing we'll integrate into a virtual file system. So every time you write to something, you actually are going to be doing a Git commit, maybe. Uh, you're going to be trying to do a git commit, but you're also going to be up against enforcement of the type of the file. What is the type of a file? What's that mean? Well, we, can, we have a huge range of possibilities here, but there's really simple ones that we would like. Things like my text files should end with a, like not have like a partial line at the end with no new line. Right, and you, so you see all these sort of like ad hoc attempts to sort of retrofit that sort of thing. I just, just make it true, always. Don't let it not be true. Or, I mean, there's any number of sort of uh, like bash level or source code level or just sort of code sanity level. You could even have, you know, the formatting be part of the type. There's literally anything you can think of can be part of the type. Uh, because all that you're doing here is writing an acceptance function for a change to the file so that when somebody tries to do something to it, then either it's still true, in which case we can commit it, or we know of a way to make it true, in which case we can do that and then commit it, or it isn't true, in which case we won't commit it. And therefore, uh, sanity is preserved across all rights. And we uh, can expose everything interesting about files in the metadata through extended file attributes. So if a file has a type in the sense that a person said this file has this type, we'll expose that in the metadata. If it has a type in the sense that we looked at it and said it probably has this type, like it's called foo.mp3 and has audio data in it, I mean, we can easily infer that to be an MP3 file, but that's still different than the user saying, like, I know this is an MP3 file. Um, so we expose that in the metadata. And if we have no idea what it is, we'll expose that in the metadata. But point is, all of our, the, these, this rich information about what's inside of files is all stuff that we'll expose in a way that's easily accessible by tools. So there's this persistent analogy that works really well. Um, compile time, runtime. A uh, program has compile time. Types are the things that you know, we check at compile time. Then we run it, and then things happen. Well. There's kind of a compile time for files and a runtime for files. Compile time is when you try to change it. And runtime is when you need it. Runtime is when you need it to have like, you know, some something needs to be true about it. So right now we effectively defer every such integrity check to the time when you need it. And I'm saying we can do it when we change it, so that we already know without having to the, the, the the consumer doesn't have to be like, OK, now let's double check the truth of whether this is that or just crash horribly if it's not. If it says it's an XML file, it should be an XML file. You should know it 100%. There's no reason to have any doubt about that. And it's easy to enforce just by never committing a change to an XML file that doesn't produce another XML file. And that's a syntactic constraint. That's easy. You could also have arbitrarily complicated semantic constraints. If it's like a Maven Palm file, then whatever the hell, I mean, I don't have a clue, but I bet there's a whole bunch of constraints, some known, some unknown, <laughs> unknown to man or, or, be, or computer program, but still, we can, we can ferret these things out eventually. Um, there, there are constraints, though, about how those things evolve. And it would be easy to actually have like sensibility constraints, like your version number shouldn't suddenly drop by 10. Right? Like this is why looking at changes is relevant. If your version, like the version that you produce should increase monotonically, you can enforce that in the file and not commit. Right? Like you can actually have a check against these kinds of sanity things that you're completely at the dependent of people right now doing their process correctly. These things can be codified, encapsulated, and used like clubs. So, Anybody who, heard, who stopped right there would think to themselves, well, that guy's going to have some real problems. 
when something happens like some very sensible write is broken by the operating system into two writes, and so you get a half write, and then like it's not right, and everything blows up. No, because fortunately, we have this nice buffer zone. If you try to do a write to a file that is not type correct in the sense that it conforms to the defined acceptable set of changes, then it does not get committed, but it doesn't get thrown away. It's still there. It's in the, it dirties the git index. So we have this virtual git repository, and now we have a virtual dirty uh, git repository. So those of us that are looking at the files in a direct way, which is all of us all the time right now, since we lack this system, um, would see the change. But most of our code that runs in general, the code we're not actively developing or otherwise needs to do things like see this change, is looking at the repository itself directly. It's working from a virtual file system that doesn't see any dirty changes. It just sees what's in the repo. So it's invisible. Those, th that code never sees it. And when later another write comes along and fixes it, and it is type correct change, then it gets committed, and then it's seen. So all this code, all of our code, all the time can actually assume things about its inputs. Um, and these things that it assumes can be arbitrarily interesting, like far more interesting than you can write in, in any programming language I'm aware of. Um, and that's pretty powerful stuff, because you actually have a lot of uh, room here for like time-consuming type checking. You, I mean, for that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to take five minutes to do it, but you kind of could because uh, in, the user is really insulated from it. This is all kind of happening asynchronously, and it either gets committed or it doesn't. But you can just proceed with your life like it's all getting committed if you want. So we have these multiple views, and there, you know, I've only described two. There could be more. There's like various scenarios one can imagine. You can have like there can be middle grounds between good and bad, like probably good or sketchy or you know who knows, right? Like it just depends on your system. But the opportunity is here for arbitrarily, you know, complicating the different views of the world. The important one, though, is the is the central one, the one where everything is always properly typed, and everything else is just like how much room do we want to give ourselves to wiggle? Typed source code. So here's where we get into some actual Scala. So that's what you, I know this is what you came for. You're dying for this. <laughs> so we're going to have typed Scala code, but we're going to mean this a little differently, right? We're not talking about types in the internal compiler model. We're talking about the, the file itself, the source file. Is it well typed from our point of view? And our point of view is not the. Uh, not is going to be different, it's actually a subset of the same idea, which is to say it's well-typed Scala code from our point of view if we can parse it and get through the namer phase, which is to say assign symbols, bind the names. And so then we will store all that information, and now we'll only allow changes that retain that property. So you can't actually make your Scala code not parse ever again, right? There's no way to, un to have code that doesn't parse, not in the repository, because that's not well-typed. And now, every change that we make to our source code that's well typed in, in the sense of, in our sense, not in their sense, is a change in the repository that lets us see how our code is evolving in terms of the AST, because that's guaranteed to be available since that's the point. That's how far we're typing our source files. And let's see what that can mean example wise. All right, so this is the kind of bug I've seen many, 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 many times. And it's kind of like the 75 miles an hour, zero miles an hour thing, in the sense that each of these programs individually, uh, short of a like AI level analysis, uh, it looks plausible. Of course, you may be a pretty bad variable namer for either of these to be plausible. But still, there's nothing like a, no a priori way to say like one of these is definitely wrong. But the change from one to the other is the kind of change that's almost always wrong. Can we see what the bug is here? <laughs> yeah, so we're shadowing. We have a backup sim there ready to fall through into our scope. Now, we change the name of an invariable, and we, but we miss one. But it still compiles because it falls through from above. This is never correct. Even if this was what you meant, you're a jerk for forever having code that you could like where this could have been correct. You're still wrong. Um, it, this change can't possibly be decomposed into a sensible series of changes. It's wrong, but you cannot see that unless you're looking at it from the point of view of the change 
and not from the point of view of source file, here comes source file again. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we're after here, change orientation. So it isn't just that we can enforce type correctness of each of those, which we can, it's that the errors that we issue are, that is an automatic error for us, that, that, uh, an error that Scala C can never give in its batch mode. So now things get really interesting. So our, our system is loaded with typed files. Many of them will have a type as simple as like sequence of lines of text, right? It'll just be like, it's, it's UTF-8. It has lines of UTF-8. Um, but even that is very useful all by itself if we're going to maintain that invariant. It's actually easy when you're just writing random bytes to a file to screw it up and make it invalid UTF-8. That's bad. Shouldn't allow that. We don't have to allow that. Um, but more interestingly, at the shell level and from the interactive standpoint, if we have these typed lines, or you know, that may be lines or maybe something even more interesting, then we know a bunch about the individual elements and we have typed pipelines. So we can act on, not on lines of text, but on T's, whatever a T is, and furthermore, everything that we know about a T can feed into the shell so that we can get things like completion on all the names of the fields of the thing that is a T. So the example here on the third line, which says cat some comma separated value thing, and then goes into a filter, and then it goes underscore dot n. And so presumably the first line of that CSV was the names of the columns, one of which was like name. And then here I am typing n tab, which completes to name because it, can, it knows perfectly well exactly what's in that CSV file and what the names of the columns are. Um, so, and then for that matter, now it knows that those are strings and so it can, it can work on strings at this point. We can get like the kind of completion on the command line that's available in IDEs um, better in many ways. And all we need is to like expose this information and maintain it, which is trivially achieved uh, in the uh, hypothetical not existing system I'm describing. <laughs> trivially achieved, that's right. And then, of course, you know, like we have, there's this crazy series of uh, 50 years of accumulated hacks and things like find and ls and whatever to, uh, you know, chomp through these like single bits of data and figure out what they mean. And it's, it's crazy. It's nuts, right? I mean, we, we can have like a, a complete attribute map associated with any file, which is to say typed metadata. Right, like meaningfully typed metadata. You can have a thing called size that actually has a size and isn't just some random int that's overloaded to mean the length of the string for the target of a symbolic link or the length of a file for a file or the number of uh, references for a directory plus two. Um, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. Uh, all of this can just be, this is Gordian knot territory. Uh, the, all of this can be redone in a vastly simpler fashion. Some of it would still have to run on that infrastructure, but from the user standpoint, we can have find grep type tools that are just a million times smarter and have a tenth of the options. And one of the great things that anybody uses a typed language, especially Scala knows, is the great advantage of types for filling in the gaps in your thing. So you need an A and you have a B, but it knows the relationship between Bs and As and it can just make your B and A. That's really handy. It's a lifesaver uh, in many, many cases. In fact, I mean, it's not just implicit conversions, but implicits in general are just ways of setting up logic to help you to like step in and say like, this is how I want things to work when you reach this point where you've got this kind of A and this kind of B. This is how that works. Well. We can push that really far. We know how to convert between every imaginable kind of audio, video, image. We know all this stuff. You need like three programs, FFmpeg and you know whatever the equivalent is and a couple others. So literally from that point forward, never again do you have to be like, oh, I've got a, you know, a wave and I need a, you know, AAC. Who cares, man? Why is this much busy work inflicted on people? We know how to do it. We should just say, hey, computer, this is how it happens. 
And then when you need a wave and you give it an MP3, it's just like, okay, man, I'm just going to make that into a wave. Now, clearly, there are like you know interesting questions here: how to deal with like lossy versus lossless, and expense and caching and la la la. But you know what? All those questions exist in the busy work version too. Uh, plus, you have the busy work, so I think you're much better off actually having an opportunity to define it in one place. Say, this is how it works. Come bug me if you're confused. I'm going back to doing some actual logic and not busy work for you, computer. That's my last slide. I'll take questions. <laughs> Hold your applause, please. We'll have a nice ro uh, rowdy one later. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, so a, by sequence, sequence is a, kind of a wrongly leading term. I actually want to say decomposable. Um, so we're really looking at like something more like the pattern calculus, where things are either atomic or, or com composite, and, and each element is either the next, you know, it's, it's either decomposable into two elements of unknown decomposition, or it's atomic. Um, so yes, you, you can walk a tree that way, you know, you can decompose anything that way. Uh, that's intentional. Yeah. It's I knew there'd be some jerk that took that example. <laughs> And pointed out how bad it was. I wrote that like 20 minutes ago. I'm like, this, I'm writing, I'm like, this is the worst. Okay, true. But on the other hand, it's good in the sense that it point like that it brings up that question because like this stuff is all at the boundary. Yes, for sure. You have to define like if you want to avoid sort of pathological behavior, you know, you're not just gonna say, just do whatever conversion feels good, computer, it's no problem, right? I mean, you don't want it like just turning every single MP3 into a into a bad flack just because you happen to ask for some flax or something, right? <laughs> yeah. I think it, you end up uh, defining uh, like a sort of a, you need you need an abstraction that folds over all your audio data, really, right? And so, like, and then of course there's you know there's like some stuff that you can sort of universally have, and it's not much, and it's the classic sort of look at my cross-platform toolkit and how much it sucks, right? Because I've managed to do the three things you can do on every platform, um, but. That said, like this is totally a solvable and like a distributable problem. Because one of the great advantages of, of this approach is that we can crowdsource a great deal of logic, right? Like we can have like, you know, a Git repository essentially of type information about files. And we send pull requests to some sensible person who's like pulling stuff together that is able to make sense of our things. And again, it's like when you compare it to the status quo, it's miles ahead. It's easy to see like places where it'll break down if we're stupid about it, but presumably we're not, right? We, we'll avoid those uh, and get the good parts. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so he asks how to distinguish between a good write that comes in two parts versus a bad write that's thrown away. So uh, the bad write isn't thrown away. The bad write is just essentially buffered. Um, you don't distinguish between those. You either see a good write, which is committed, or you see a bad write, which isn't, followed later by another bad write, which turns into a good write on top of the previous bad write, which is then committed, or you see another bad write, which is still not committed. So. There can be arbitrarily many rights, and only when it adds up to a right that's valid is it committed. Does that, does that answer your question? Does that, let's say you want to back up after making a bad right, go back to the previous So uh, that is where we have to head into multiple universes beyond two. That's sort of what I was avoiding when I said like you want because we could also have a repo we could we could commit every right, even bad ones. And so then we would have a repository of type correct things. We would have a repository of pending bad rights. 
and we would have, uh, you know, dirty index, maybe, or we wouldn't. But in that scenario, if we commit everything but have a, a blessed repository and a not one, then it's just a matter of coalescing rights in the one repository, in the bad repository, and then moving them over to the good. But for simplicity, I kind of take the position that in general, you, that doesn't happen, and when it does, it's very short term. And so uh, for now, I assume that like dirty right sort of approach works. Yeah. Well, so I consider ACID to be um, the concern of people above me, um, right? It's like a, people want to ask questions about like distributed objects and ACID and like all kinds of fascinating stuff, and I'm all for it. Um, but honestly, all of those are like you somehow you manage to build whatever you build now on top of much less reliable files than I'm proposing to give you. Thus, I would say it is like a strict improvement to just say like, well, I could use these better files to do things the way I'm doing now, and anything else is gravy. Are the types themselves versioned? Uh, absolutely. In fact, this is like this change orientation is is extremely pervasive. So yes, uh, it's all it's it's turtle wheels all the way down. Um, uh, yes, uh, managing like how the it, because it's still only a, you've moved from like one dimension to two dimension when you stop looking at value snapshots and look at the value history. But you now need a third dimension effectively, which is the value history now intertwined with the changes to the type, if any, that also occurred over time. Right, so, uh, but this is all tractable stuff if one takes a highly change-oriented view of the matter. So, yeah, uh, sure. Versioned, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, how do you represent types? Are they themselves files? Well, that, so, th th the, at the moment, like a type is an interface, so, uh, it's just some, uh, what it, you know, at the, at the very simplest, most universal, it would be a program that you can run and give it a file input that either returns zero or one, which is to say either this is a member of that type or not. So then we'll have like, you know, much more sophisticated sort of ways to plug into that, but that's the, the essence of it. It's something, it's again that oracle, is this the right, is this valid for this type or no? Yeah, no, it's you. I'm pointing right at you. You. I asked you this a long time ago, but I forgot. What, what, um, uh, how do you deal with this from the point of view of you know, trying to like, deploy like, several applications on the same computer that may have different requirements for these crazy file system plugins since you're moving stuff that used to be an application library up to the file system? Like, So, uh, well, they don't necessarily need to separate themselves. We actually are way ahead of the status quo in the question is like, you have things with different requirements for maybe the same files on the same system. Um, we have a huge opportunity here for like, just for a random example, you could run like any version of Scala you want out of a same place with just sticking the version into the path because a virtual file is able to analyze, you know, what the path was and come up with it. Like, you know, I have a symlink that is to the latest version of Scala, whatever it happens to be. That's not something I have to manually update. That is always the latest version of Scala because it's logic instead of just being a fixed link. Um, uh, symlinks that, that are to things other than fixed paths are super crazy powerful, it's like a symlink to a database query um, or, you know, you name it. And so because everything's under revision control and because the entire thing is designed around the notion of being able to present a repository commit as the file system from which you work, it's really quite trivial to have any number of views of the same data to different applications. Um, yeah, the, the, so that, that turns out to be like the easiest problem. Now there's always a management problem when you have something like that, but I think it's a management problem you have anyway. Sorry, I, don't, I just don't know what time it is. I don't wanna, oh, okay, we're good. Um, okay, uh, yes. Do you still have a file oh, so I, did, I might have glossed over that, but <laughs> I did gloss over that. So type inference, how do you do type inference? Well, it's funny, Type what type inference is. I mean, type inference is the same thing that we do by hand right now, which is like, look at the extension, run file on it, right? 
You run file on it, and it's like, looks like a, a, you know, UTF-8 encoded text or whatever. It looks like MP3 audio data. Great. So uh, probably, you know, like on when you first fire up Suffuse, like you run the file utility on everything in the system and stick it in the metadata. The, the inferred type is what file says it is, right? And then you refine from there. Um, so now, but now your file utility is much stronger because it can actually look at the real metadata and say like it's, it is, I don't even need to look, I don't need to process these eight gigabytes of image in order to tell you it's a JPEG because I can trust the file system and it says it's a JPEG, done, um, right? It doesn't like, everything is brute force in Unix essentially on, a, on an untyped file system. If you run WC, on a file and it tells you there's 80 billion words and now you stick a line at the end, it's gonna just start that over again from scratch. Uh, but we could have something like has 80 billion words in the type, right? I mean, there's no, like, there's no, no restrictions here on the thing, right? And then we can actually look at that from the point of view of 80 billion word file plus, you know, 80 characters of text with nine spaces in it. Oh, okay, so now it's an 80 billion and nine word file. That's an acceptable change, right? I've just moved from the singleton type of 80 billion word files to the singleton type of 80 billion and nine word files, but that's okay because they're both within the range of acceptable changes that I've predefined for these large files of interesting words. Um, if that gives you any gist. <laughs> Other questions? Eric. I cannot in good conscience even begin to answer this question. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I have, so I've, I've obsessed lately about data and codata in part because I'm very interested in restricted languages because there's no reason to work with like general recursion all the time, it's nuts. Um, similarly, there's no reason to work with like things that change things all the time, right? Um, for the most part, like I would expect to partition type definitions into you know things that are safe and things that aren't, which in, and almost everything we do should be safe if we had a proper notion of how to separate safe things from unsafe. So yes, uh, I I acknowledge the existence of this problem. I just don't see it as uh, like right in my face yet. One can ask a similar question about performance, and that I could also just sort of throw my hands up and say, well, just you wait and we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, not, they're interesting problems, but they're, the, and the big thing is that the status quo is, is already plenty bad. The thing is that these, it's all spread out over a million different ad hoc ways that are all vulnerable in the same ways, whereas we have an opportunity to actually treat these things uniformly. I guess that's probably time. One more, okay. Right there. Your question? You? You? You guys have you you filed out. Yes. Yes. Well, I, IPFS is is a distributed hash table, and which is very high on the list of things I want to do with it. Um, so that's today. I just I went really narrow with what I was talking about. But yes, in other talks I have talked about distributed hash table, which is and IPFS is definitely going in like very interesting. Like very similar, very much overlap, yes. Eighty billion. Yeah, so the question is how that information is represented about like what you know about it. So that's, you know about extended file attributes? Um, the extended file attributes are, uh, are our opportunity for uh, ha exposing arbitrarily interesting metadata, typed metadata actually, because they can have types as well, right? Like so it's, you know, it's typed things all the way down. Um, but something like that would essentially be a, uh, there would be an attribute if you did x adder dash L on the file, you'd get some meaningful list of keys, which you have some like well-known translation, which is defined in the suffuse specification for, but one way or another, it'll at worst lead to an oracle, which will tell you whether this change is acceptable. 
All right, I guess we will stop there. Thank you very much, everybody. Now you may clap if you like. <laughs>